Welcome to Market Matters, our markets podcast on Making Sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In this episode of Market Matters, we'll hear from the market data and positioning intelligence teams within our data assets and alpha group. They'll be talking about key macro, micro, and political themes in the context of our high-frequency trading data and proprietary signals from J.P. Morgan's markets business. Hi, I'm Edwina Lowe, Product Specialist within the Data Assets and Alpha Group here at J.P. Morgan. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Eloise Goulder, Head of the Wider Data Assets and Alpha Group, to unpack the sharp market rally we saw through January and equity signals from here. So, Eloise, thank you so much for being here once again. Thank you so much, Edwina. It's great to be here. And I do think there's a lot to discuss today in the context of the sharp equity market rally we've seen this year. Yes, definitely. Well, we've certainly seen some very dramatic market moves this year, and it's only February. I thought today that we could dig into what's happened year to date and put some context around it. We've seen the market rally across all regions. We've contended with China reopening, the Fed slowing its pace of hikes, and Europe macro data improving and positively surprising, which could potentially mean we've averted a near-term recession. But I also want to talk through what our own data toolkits and signals say in this context, how they play in, and where the risk-reward lies from here. That sounds great. So, Eloise, let's start with the recent market moves. What exactly has happened year-to-date? Thanks, Edwina. Well, I think you set the scene really well there in terms of discussing those key global dynamics that we've seen this year across the Fed slowing its pace of hikes, China reopening and European macro data improving and surprising positively, admittedly from a very low base. And I guess the main point to note is that we've seen a really strong equity rally in that context. Global equity indices are up anywhere between 5 and, say, 15% this year alone. And that's on top of a rally which started in the late part of last year, depending on the region. The Nasdaq in the US is up 14% this year. Europe's Eurostox 50 is up 11% this year. And across many of the other global indices, the US S&P 500, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, China's CSI 300 Index and Japan's Nikkei Index, they're all up in the 5 to 8% region this year. Thematically, cyclicals have led in most regions, particularly across the consumer space and travel and leisure, autos, banks, and also tech companies, as reflected in the Nasdaq, have rallied hard this year. And what would you say has been the driver of these moves? Well, put simply, I would say it is optimism or an improvement in sentiment, perhaps linked to the unwinding of the hawkish concerns that investors had previously. So if we hark back to our conversation in December, where we provided that year in review for 2022, we discussed then that We saw a hawkish macro trade play out through much of last year, at least in the early part of last year, as inflation expectations rose, central banks had that decidedly hawkish tone, bond yields were rising, commodity prices were rising, and equities were falling in response to all of this. And we spoke in December about that hawkish macro trade beginning to reverse from around Q3 of last year. So in terms of your question, Edwina, what has been the driver of these moves? I would say in many ways this year, it has been increased optimism and a fading of that more hawkish narrative that we had seen through the early parts of last year. Having said all of that, there have also been some additional positive drivers for equity markets this year, notably around growth dynamics improving or growth not being as bad as was previously feared. So in China, we've had the reopening story and excitement around how much a reopening in activity could boost domestic, but also potentially global growth. And then in Europe, growth data points like PMIs have improved, admittedly from pretty low levels, and we seem to have avoided an imminent recession. And then if we dig under the surface of equity performance this year, we've seen cyclicals rally, which is presumably because of that incrementally more supportive growth data. 
We've also seen duration assets like tech and the Nasdaq rally, which is presumably on less hawkish central bank expectations. And then also we've seen heavily shorted equities disproportionately rally, which speaks, I think, to the narrative around this year-to-date market rally being a short squeeze. Can I pick up on that point then? You mentioned heavily shorted baskets outperforming. Would you characterise this market rally as a short squeeze? And what do you mean by that? Yes, I'd definitely say we've seen a short squeeze amid this market rally. And what do I mean by that? Well, investors had placed a significant amount of shorts last year, through June and through the second half of last year as a whole, presumably on concerns around policy and macro data. But we've got plenty of evidence that these shorts have since been closed or covered, which may be a forced move, forced because those shorts have proved so painful as they've been rallying recently, which may imply that investors no longer have conviction that those shorts will go down. And therefore, they're increasingly of the view that the more optimistic playbook around the Fed beginning to slow its pace of tightening and global growth getting better could play out. So how do we see evidence of that short squeeze? Firstly, we can see it in the trading activity that we track within the hedge fund space. So if we look in the prime book, much of the trading behaviour we've seen this year has been shorts being closed, which of course leads to net buying. On a global basis, around half of the shorts that were added through December have since been closed. And then if we look at CTA positioning, CTAs being the more trend-following hedge funds, our models also suggest that they've been actively closing shorts in the US markets this year. They started this year net short US markets, and now their positions are almost neutral. But then secondly, in terms of looking for evidence of that short squeeze, it's pretty clear if we simply look at performance. So if we look at our most shorted baskets, these are baskets tracking stocks with the greatest short base as a proportion of the market cap per public filings. Then we see that those baskets have rallied a whole 40% in the US and in Europe. In the US, that's since late December, so in just over a month. And in Europe, that's since late September. They started to rally a little bit earlier in Europe than the US. And this rally in heavily shorted stocks has been somewhat reminiscent of the meme stock short squeeze that we saw back in January 2021, two years ago, with heavy participation back then from the retail investor. And indeed, it's worth noting that we've also seen retail trading activity back to net buying this year. But then equally, if we look at momentum laggards, they are the stocks that have underperformed markets the most over the last 12 months they have also disproportionately rallied this year. So it's been a case of the laggards catching up. And in fact, if we look at the pair of winners versus losers in the US, that's known as our momentum long versus momentum short factor pair, we see that the pair have reversed well over half of the gains they made through last year, just through the month of January alone. And this unwind in momentum was particularly sharp last week amid that market rally. That all sounds pretty painful. Has this market rally been a pain trade? Well, given that shorts are rallying, we do think that it's been a challenging environment for long short spreads across many hedge funds. Having said that, to the extent that hedge funds or investors are also holding a net long bias, so a skew towards the market with greater longs than shorts, then the market rally has at least helped out a bit and perhaps offset some of that pain. The short squeeze sounds like a technical phenomenon. Would it therefore be accurate to say that the equity moves we've seen year to date have been driven more by technical than fundamental reasons? Well, that's a great question. And I think both the fundamental and the technical drivers go in sync. So fundamental drivers may have been behind that short squeeze and the reason for investors to net buy or at least close shorts. But of course, that led to heavily shorted stocks being closed and then disproportionately rallying. And that could open up a more technical dislocation where those heavily shorted stocks have rallied too far, that dislocation could be particularly interesting for investors with a more bearish outlook on markets at this stage. Thank you. That's really interesting. 
Uh, we've now given quite a lot of airtime to the bullish narrative. Perhaps we could now turn to the opposing view. Yes. Well, we now have a situation where major markets have only fallen small amounts from their absolute peaks. So the European Stock 600 is only down around 7% from peaks. And the US S&P 500 is down less than 15% from peaks. And yet, of course, there are plenty of risks out there. So I think the bearish narrative rests on the idea that the worst is yet to come from a macro perspective, that there's a lag between central bank rate hikes and impact on the real economy, and that the hikes that we've seen so far will take months to ripple through, that inflation is still very elevated and central banks will need to hike, particularly in Europe, given the ECB started its hiking cycle four months after the Fed started. And then on top of all of this, there are numerous geopolitical concerns out there. It's worth noting that our house view is relatively cautious in the near term, and it's aligned with some of those points. And our team's signals, which are not from research, but from the trading business here, and are very tactical, are also not outright bullish on any major market right now. So... I think both the house view and our team's tactical signals are more aligned with that more cautious narrative right now. Thank you. That naturally brings me on to our flagship market timing indicator, Signal from the Noise, which we rolled out globally at the end of last year. If I refer back to our year in review podcast in mid-December, you said that our signals were getting more supportive on China, benefiting from recent positioning momentum, perhaps linked to reopening hopes. On the other hand, Japan, which had been screening positively for much of 2022, fell back into neutral territory in mid-December because Flo's momentum had weakened there. And these signals did in fact play out. China rallied amid reopening tailwinds. Japan underperformed, particularly post more hawkish BOJ in mid-December. So what do our toolkits say today? Thanks, Edwina. Well, that's absolutely right. Our signals went tactically more supportive of Chinese equities than of Japanese equities back in mid-December, as we discussed on our podcast then. And that was indeed helpful context because we then saw that reopening-led rally in Chinese markets through the end of the year and the beginning of this year versus that sell-off in Japanese markets post the more hawkish BOJ in late December. Today, though, I think the most important message really is that we don't currently have a strong bullish signal anywhere, which is very interesting in the context of the market strength we've seen this year. And why do you think that's the case? Well, our toolkits are driven by fundamental and positioning signals. And perhaps sticking with the fundamentals for the time being, the point is that none are looking squarely supportive right now. So for our fundamental signals to be supportive, we'd need to see a combination of better macro momentum, better micro momentum in terms of earnings upgrades, a yet weaker dollar, and stronger commodity prices, for example. In no region are we ticking all of those boxes at this stage. But to go back to your prior question on what our signals are saying today, I'd say takeaway number one is that no region is outright bullish right now. And then takeaway number two is that European signals have become less supportive over the last two weeks. And I discussed this with Krupa two weeks ago, and she really articulated that more cautious view on European markets relative to the US. As a recap, European markets have outperformed US markets over the last three months, perhaps linked to the China exposure and the incrementally less bad macro data in Europe. But fundamentally in Europe, inflation is still higher than in the US. The ECB still needs to hike more and is further away from that peak hawkish territory. And the relative trade, more cautious Europe versus the US, is beginning to work well. US markets have disproportionately rallied relative to European markets over the last couple of weeks. But we do think that that could go further. Thank you, Eloise. I think that's a good note to wrap up on. This has been a really interesting discussion covering the dramatic market moves we've seen so far this year and digging into why these may have happened and what the implications are from here. My key takeaway is that despite these positive swings, our toolkits suggest a more cautious or neutral short-term outlook. It will certainly be interesting to see how things play out from here, and I look forward to our next discussion. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Edwina. 
As a reminder to our listeners, we provide daily updates to our signals via daily automated email, as well as API via Fusion or Data Query. Please do reach out if you'd be interested in documentation or a teach-in via the Contact Us form on our website. Thank you once again to our listeners for tuning in. Thank you also to those of you who've reached out to our team to discuss markets further or to give us feedback. We really do appreciate that. As a reminder, if you'd like to explore our wider team content further or get in touch, please take a look at our website, jpmorgan.com forward slash market dash data dash intelligence. There you can always send us a message via the contact us form. And with that, we will close. Thank you. If you're enjoying this conversation, you can subscribe as well as our other podcasts to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Follow JP Morgan's Making Sense on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. The views expressed in this podcast may not necessarily reflect the views of JP Morgan Chase & Co. and its affiliates. Together, JP Morgan. They are not the product of JP Morgan's research department and do not constitute a recommendation, advice, or an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or financial instrument. This podcast is intended for institutional and professional investors only and is not intended for retail investor use. It is provided for information purposes only. Reference products and services in this podcast may not be suitable for you and may not be available in all jurisdictions. JP Morgan may make markets and trade as principal in securities and other asset classes and financial products that may have been discussed. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, please visit www.jpmorgan.com forward slash disclosures forward slash sales and trading disclaimer.